a just an amazing career. Um, so you started off in radio and then worked your way to TV and sort of squirmed around, or or how did I, it I actually all begin? Did a lot for of you? it at, at the same time. I'll yeah. tell you a little story. When I was, uh, I guess, eleven years old, I, I knew what I wanted to do. There were three things I wanted to do. Wow. I wanted to, I wanted to be on the radio. I, you know, grew up in San Antonio, and the big station here was KTSA, and I knew that I wanted to be the guy on the radio playing all this great music. And I also knew that I wanted to work for Walt Disney. <laughs> wow. I used to watch the wonderful world of Disney, the Mickey Mouse Club, and I wanted to be part of that fun. And the third thing, and this kind of happened by accident, I learned, Patrick, at an early age that I had an uncanny ability, if not an obligation, to mimic voices that I heard. I would, I'd be at uh, the grocery store and somebody walked by with an accent and I'd start talking like that. And I'm this kid. And my mom would say, don't do it. Don't do that. I said, but mom, that's the way she sounds. <laughs> it's, it just kind of came out of me. And then one day I was watching my favorite cartoon show, which was Yogi Bear. And, you know, Yogi always had that great persona. Hey, 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 I'm Yogi Bear. Smarter than the average bear. And what was his little friend's name? Uh, oh my gosh, boo boo. boo, boo. That's right, boo, boo. Yogi. Yogi, we're gonna get in trouble with a ranger. Don't worry about a thing, little boo boo. But what it changed <laughs> for me, I love it. when everything changed for me, was when I was watching this one episode and there was a little duck that w thought Yogi was his mother and he kept saying, Mr. Bear, Mr. Bear, would you be my mama? And he was a little orphan duck walking around following Yogi. And this little voice came out of him. And I thought, oh, my, what a great voice. And I thought to myself, and I, keep in mind, I'm, I'm 11 years old. I don't know that the people who do those voices, they're professionals. They've been doing it for years. All I knew that I was going to do that voice. So I turned off the TV. I had a little recorder. I started taping myself and recording it. And it came out real raspy. Mr. Bear, Mr. Bear. I mean, to the point where I got a sore throat. <laughs> but one day, one day out of my little 11 year old mouth came, Mr. Bear, Mr. Bear, would you be my mama? I don't have a mama. I'm just a poor little ducky. And that was the beginning of an incredible um, kind of a, a epiphany that I had like, oh my gosh, I can make this guy say anything. So I continued to do all these different voices. And uh, we lived in not in a house, but in the back of my dad's barbershop, actually in the barbershop. My dad had a little two seat barbershop that still the building still stands at the corner of, of Nolan and Pine. If you're from San Antonio on wow. a little strip center on the east side. And wow. my dad partitioned half of the barbershop and we lived in half of that. And, and it wasn't even a full address. Our address was 908 and a half Nolan Street. The other <laughs> half was a print shop. <laughs> and at night, Patrick, my dad would give me because my dad knew, you know, how 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 much I, I love to entertain, how much I love to to do what I did. And I would record these little shows with my recorder and my record player. And those are coming back. I used to be I had to explain what a record player was. But now, <laughs> you know, millennials have them. Yeah. So I, I had a record player and I would mimic the DJ that I would hear on the radio and, and pretend like I was the DJ and I'd put the record on. And while, the, while I was talking and putting it on, I would do the, uh, the patter that the DJs would do. And then I would take that little five minute show and my dad would give me three dimes and I'd go into the barbershop in the dark, sit on the shoe shine stand next to the payphone, And I would dial one friend at a time and play these little shows. I was podcasting. <laughs> that is podcasting. Yeah. That's like, oh one God. listener, one listener at a time. For wow. all I know, they put the phone down and came back later and said, oh yeah, that was great. I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> but, but here's, here's, here's the, wow. here's the kicker. So fast forward. And the reason we lived in the back of the barbershop was so that my dad and my mom could save money to send my brother and me to parochial school, to Catholic school, and also to college. So fast forward, I graduate from high school, going to college, and at the college radio station, they, they made me the program director. 
And I thought to myself, this is incredible. I'm, I'm getting a degree in radio. I didn't even know they had this. So as time went on, after it was, a, it was San Antonio College, which is an incredible community college here in San Antonio. And from there, I went to uh, El Paso, to what is now UTEP. And while I was there, I got my first job. And my first job was working for $1.25 an hour on Sunday mornings from 5 a.m. to noon, seven hours. And Patrick, wow. I would look at the clock and I would say, oh, good. I still have five more hours. I still have four. I still have three. To this day, that's the way I look at the clock, whether it's a podcast, whether it's in front of a, an audience. You, I think you think you've got the same... Uh, um, you know, the same modus operandi, but I would literally just think to myself, I, I, this is too much fun. And then within six months, our competition was a little daytime station came to me and said, what are you making over there? I said, dollar 25 an hour it says, how'd you like to make a dollar 50 full time? Well, I could believe it. <laughs> this is incredible. <laughs> and oh, so wow. within six years, I made a name for myself, gotten a national award from Billboard magazine. And then because I learned to program the radio station as well, I got a call from, guess what? KTSA in San Antonio. And they hired me to be their program director and on air. Wow. So that radio station under my pillow I was not only on the air, I was running the show. And within an, a year, I got another award, and then I got the call to go to L.A. And so I went to Los Angeles and uh, I never looked back. Yeah, that's, wow, that is, what an amazing story to come back to, you know. I just, I love this story about you calling your friends and playing the show. <laughs> for, I just absolutely love that so much. I think that's so cool that your dad was, uh, pushing you to do it. Oh you know? yeah. Yeah. He was real, right. real supportive, both my mom and my dad. And you know, it's funny because that, that was the radio dream that I had. I get to LA, I'm on the radio and I do all these voices on my show. And an agent calls me and said, have you ever thought about doing cartoon work? I said, are you kidding? I, since I was a kid, he says, well, <laughs> let me have a sample of, of your, uh, of your voices and I'll see what I can do. Two weeks later, Patrick, I got my first job uh, at the Hanna-Barbera Studios, the home of Yogi Bear and that little duck. Wow. And I wasn't there as an intern. I was there to actually work with the original cast doing the second season, different voices on the Jetsons. Oh, and, wow. Oh, yeah. And it, got, it gets better than that. <laughs> I, view, I don't know if you, you knew this, but George Jetson, of course, had a boss. He worked at the Spacely Sprocket Company. Yeah. So his, his boss was Mr. Spacely. Well, the voice of Mr. Spacely was Mel Blanc, the voice of Bugs Bunny, Sylvester, Tweety, Elmer. It was unbelievable. And he's sitting right next to me because we're all in this room doing these scenes and I'm doing different voices that they need. And I couldn't wait for the break because the guy was... He was incredible. He would just give you so much of, of his uh, experience. He wasn't, you know, threatened or anything. And yeah. literally he became a mentor and we would have these conversations in the parking lot after the, the, uh, the recording session. But in time, I mean, in the time that we spent in the few months, he taught me many of his voices. Would you wow. like to hear some? Of course. Are you kidding me? Okay. Yes. All right. So here's, uh, starts out with um, Elmer Fudd, who's walk walking around with that funny little gun. You know, he's looking for. Be very, very quiet. I'm looking for a little gray rabbit. And when I find that rabbit, I'm going to tear him apart. Whim, whim, whim. <laughs> What's up, Doc? Have you seen a little gray rabbit? Big eyes, yeah. Big ears, yeah. Big teeth, yeah. I ain't seen him. Ain't I a stinker? Ooh, I thought I threw a pretty tad. I did. I did throw a pretty tad. You bet you saw a pretty tad. The pretty tad with me. Why, I'm the wildest. Rudeness, tootness, shootness. Yeah, shit up. There you go. 
<laughs> oh my god <laughs> wow holy cow that unbelievable Sonny. when you when you do cartoons you don't hold back you got to just uh, give it all. Is exactly, that the deal? Exactly. There's there's no uh, there's no you know meek <laughs> unless you're doing a, a little voice. Uh, but and it, and that's the way it's been for my whole life. As I I've had these wonderful uh, serendipities that have come through. Uh, and then the other part was was Disney. And in nineteen, I guess it was eighty one, I found out that there was going to be something called the Disney Channel. They were going to have yeah. their own channel with all these different shows, et cetera. And so they were looking for, for different hosts. So I didn't wait to see what they call the, you know, the trades where you get these magazines and, and you see that there's an open call for a host for this or that. I created a show and I got my agent to get me a, uh, an audience in front of what they call the suits, which is, uh, you know, the, the decision makers. And uh, so there I go driving to the uh, the Hanna Barbera Studios, and excuse me, not the Hanna Barbera, but the uh, the uh, Buena Vista Studios in uh, in Los Angeles. And I, in my my heart was literally beating out of my chest because it says Walt Disney Studios. And I'm oh my god, I can't believe this. So I walk in, and sure enough, there's three guys in suits and a lady, and they said, "Okay, Sonny, let's see what you got." And so I told him, I said, oh, I got this show. It's called Saturday in the Park. And I've got 20 kids and we go to parks all over the country. And the guest stars are in different parts of the park. And I'm doing my gyrations and everything. And at one point, the woman, the lady, she looks over at one of the guys and goes. And I thought, oh, great. They're making fun of me. But I, I, I didn't I did stop. I just kept on going. And when I was through, I expected to say for them to say, don't call us. We'll call you. Thanks a lot. What they said, though, was that's a nice uh, that's a nice idea. It's not what we're looking for. However, with your enthusiasm, we think you'd be perfect for another show that we already have called You and Me, Kid. Would you be interested? I ended up doing 120 episodes hosting You and Me, Kid on the Disney Channel. Wow, that's I mean, unbelievable. Yeah, I saw that in your in your thing. Yeah, that's unbelievable. Wow, what a story to get that right. So you went in for some other. Yeah, that's why you yeah. always go for it, right? That's exactly. why you always exactly exactly because it's you know, and, and I think really that's the way the universe works. You know, and you can appreciate this. I look at it as putting in your order. It's like you're at the the universe cafe and you're going through all. Oh, that looks good. Oh, that looks good. I'll have to, I'll take that. I'll take that. And then you close it and. And there goes, and uh, you know, you could say that the, the God is is the chef, and all these things are the moment you see something for yourself, no matter how big or how small it is, already something's happening. And now we know that thoughts really are things. Scientists tell us that thoughts have energy. What uh, what's important is that you have that vision of what it is you want for yourself. You know, I, I did a, a TEDx talk uh, about uh, something called intentional enthusiasm, where you yeah. use your enthusiasm, but you, you create it. And a lot of times people think, I can't be enthusiastic unless I've got something to be excited about. Yeah. But that's just the opposite. You can get excited because of your enthusiasm for what it is you want to do. And if you have that enthusiasm, Believe in yourself, have a vision of what it is you want, and you are grateful. Gratitude, that's the fuel for it all. If you're grateful along the way for every single moment, I'll tell you, there's nothing like it. 